you know, re reading Keith's newsletters now is like reading a novel. He's becoming the, the Leon Tolstoy of, uh, is it Leon or Ivan? He's become the Tolstoy of Silicon Leo. Valley. Leo. Leo Tolstoy. The, Leo. the longer and longer, Keith, you've got to, I think we need shorter, shorter newsletters. That's my advice, but so, some of you may be reading it. So you've got your, I found it right at the end, your tweet of the week, which we're going to start with. I think it's a nice way of, of starting our show in future. It's a Paul Graham tweet. And as always with Paul Graham, um, some people will read this and like it. Others won't. He says, uh, and this was on June 23rd, the probability that someone attacking the way Zuck runs Facebook could do a better job the probability that the equals the probability that the guy in a bar saying a wide receiver sucks for dropping a pass could have caught it himself. Is that wise Paul Graham or annoying Paul Graham, Keith? Well, um, it depends on your point of view. I think the answer is both for both people. But um, to me, it's wise Paul Graham, but it's going to annoy a lot of people because He's addressing a, an issue which has become, you know, a really, really important conversation that tech needs to have about what the role of tech is in society. Um, you know, it, basically, if you think about it, if we were talking about, I don't know, um, a camera from Canon and were complaining that the Canon camera takes pictures we object to, therefore we should change the CEO of Canon. Everyone would realize how weird it was. And Facebook is just a piece of tech. That's all it is. It's very popular and lots of people use it and therefore is very influential. So people want Zuckerberg to be, you know, more responsible than the guy who runs Canon is for the cameras. And, and I think it's a reasonable ask and it's a reasonable conversation about whether that's fair. And what Paul is saying is, even if it's fair, it would result in a far worse Facebook because who's better likely to be able to run Facebook than Zuckerberg? Mm, I, I would say it's a, a, a really annoying, uh, this is the annoying side of Graham or perhaps the annoying side of Silicon Valley. It's a tweet that reveals the profound tone deafness of, of uh, wealthy white guys like Paul Graham, who are so full of their own success that they just have no grasp on reality. Um, Z Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg is clearly pissing everybody off. And the idea that ordinary people, perhaps like you and I, or certainly like myself, don't have a right to criticize him is absolutely absurd. And I would go further than that. I would argue that most guys in a bar watching how Zuckerberg is fucking that com company up would actually do a better job. They would get it. But what's, what, what's clear with Zuckerberg is that he doesn't get it. And I mean, let's, let's move on to one of your, one of your uh, reads of the week, uh, David Kirkpatrick, who used to be one of the great cheerleaders of Facebook and is now become one of their great critics, has a piece about how more and more advertisers are not only falling out of love with, with Zuckerberg and Facebook, but actually boycotting them. So in a way, Facebook's becoming the new South Africa. Uh, you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to have dropped out of Harvard or, or have a highly sophisticated knowledge of programming to get the problem with that. Well, Andrew, you know my wife is South African, and what, what you don't know is when I was a fresh-faced undergraduate at the University of Kent in 1974, I was a strong opponent of boycotting South Africa because it was merely a symbolic gesture. At that time, it was all about not eating oranges from South Africa. And um, my point was it'd be far better to collect money to help the ANC buy guns than to boycott South Africa. And I think well, that, on Facebook, that may or may not be true, but from the point of view of Facebook, the boycotting of Unilever, which is one of the largest consumer good companies in the world, 
is an enormous uh, is is an enormous warning to the company that their current model or current unwillingness to acknowledge the problems, the editorial problems with their product, is going to cost the company on the bottom line. It's got nothing to do with the ANC or guerrilla warfare. This is a serious issue, isn't it? Well, for those of us who think that Zuckerberg is right not to interfere with content, it's um, the act of a hero to ignore the loss of money from its main advertisers. So Zuckerberg goes up in my estimation, as long as he holds the line, he's quite capable of caving to Unilever. But as long as he holds the line, I think it's, it's quite right for what is the new left's desire to censor everything it disagrees with. And I am of the left, let's make no mistake about that. But I don't approve of trying to win by blanking out your opponents or by labeling them. It's much better to take on their arguments. Is that a defense then of, of Zuckerberg? I, I do want to move on to, to free speech. What, one, uh, one of your other articles of the week is by Suzanne Nossel, the, um, the, the head of uh, Penn, uh, the, the Writers Association of America and the author of an interesting new book. Um, but is this issue about Zuckerberg about free speech or is it an unwillingness to acknowledge the um, the nature of his business of his platform after all newspapers are in the business of free yeah. speech but they still edit their their work I mean well, that, free speech can be edited it can be controlled it, it can be curated yeah look I it's interesting. I think David Kirkpatrick, by the way, all these articles are fantastic, whether you mm. or disagree with them. They're very thoughtful. Particularly uh, Kirkpatrick, who I think is, um, is really suffering in an almost existential way for the disappointment, uh, in his mind at least, of Facebook, because he was one of the original believers. Yeah, so I was going to say, I mean, David's article looks at Facebook in the context of its advertisers and ask the question is face, whether, whether Mark Zuckerberg believes it or not, Facebook is a media company because it depends on advertisers for revenue uh, and it depends on an audience for the advertisers wanting to spend uh, with it. So it, he says it, whether he likes it or not, it's a media company. My contestation on Zuckerberg's is Facebook is a platform. Actually, I think what I've dis decided this week is that neither me nor David are right that Facebook is a difficult conversation because it represents something that never existed before, which is a, a, a ubiquitous publication, let's call it a publication that, you know, 2.7 billion people can publish on. I don't know if, it, if we've ever had that. It's not the same as an internet service provider, which clearly is a platform. And it's not the same as the New York Times, which is clearly a narrow audience of people who like it. Facebook is close to being the world. And, and so that never existed and it creates some very difficult conversations that no one's ever had before. And, and so to give credit where credit's due, these are not easy conversations. Susan um, in the LA Times is, is writing in the context of those of us who think the status quo needs to change, which I would count you in and David Kirkpatrick in. And she makes the point, be careful what you ask for, because if you are uh, somebody who doesn't like the status quo, you above all else need speech to be uninhibited, because at some point your attempts to change things may come up against various authorities who will seek to stop you. And, and so, the, the, so the support for free speech, um, which weirdly enough is being questioned by the left who are not supporters of status quo, is a dangerous place to go if you yourself want to make change. That's her point. It's a very well made point. Is there though, um, isn't there a difference between the issues that are being raised by Facebook and the issues that Susan raises in her article about free speech on newspapers like the New York Times 
and the unwillingness of the left to acknowledge the credibility or even the legality of opposing views? There, there is. I, I, I think her article uh, speaks to me much more deeply than David's does because of that. Um, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when um, in, in the UK, the far right waving the Union Jack, giving themselves names like the British National Party or the National Front, uh, were marching on the streets calling for British jobs for British workers which by the way became a Labour Party slogan a little bit later. And much of my colleagues on the left argued for something called no platform for fascists. And uh, my very first political experience was going to a march in London, throwing smoke bombs at them and trying to knock them off the streets, um, the fascists. So um, that no platform uh, uh, for views you disagree with has been part of a left-wing point of view for many, many decades, has now become pretty ubiquitous. And I think it doesn't serve as well because the popularity of bad ideas can't be combated by constraining their distribution. It's much better to point out how bad they are as ideas and argue the case a little bit like I'm a little bit frustrated with Joe Biden now because he's comfortably sitting in his in his um, basement, as Trump accuses him, uh, not feeling the need to take Trump's arguments on about the border or Mexicans being rapists or, you know, uh, lots and lots of other issues because he's so far ahead, he doesn't feel the need to argue his case. That isn't the same thing. But it's, it's another example of not feeling the need to argue a case. It, it comes from an entitled point of view, the point of view that you're right, therefore don't engage. And that, that doesn't work well with people who are neutral and in the middle. May be true, may not be, well, it's certainly something we'll come back to. Let's, let's, let's get back to tech and venture and the the opportunities and challenges of Silicon Valley. Uh, another piece that you select this week is by uh, a former VP at Facebook, whose name I am not going to, um, I am not going to try. I'm just gonna say he's Chamath P and most of the people watching this will know his last name, but it's far too hard a name to pronounce on a Friday afternoon. Um, he's warning and he's, very successful tech executive, controversial in some ways in his own right, made a lot of money since leaving Facebook too. He's saying that um, the government, for better or worse, is gonna break up big tech. I think this is an interesting piece and an interesting position and can be contrasted, I think, quite, quite vividly with some of the sort of optimism about big tech, at least from a business point of view, articulated by people like Scott Galloway, who still seems to think that investing in Amazon and Facebook and Google is wise in economics terms. So for me, the interesting thing about Chamath's argument is it, is it might be one to suggest that you should sell your Amazon and Facebook and Google and, uh, and Apple stock right now. What's your take, Keith, on this? Well, I think the first thing to say is Chamath is a, a, a very- um, um, exuberant, Shrewd. Exuberant character. Mm. strong independent spirit and um, a very unique point of view on many many issues um, what what he's predicting here isn't necessarily something he approves of but he's making the point that um, big tech in general is so powerful now that governments are going to try to break it up um, now that's not a new point it's not a point he originated with him. It's a point Kara Swisher, for example, has been making for a long time and asking for. And I've been making it even longer. So, you know, it's, awesome. and, and people before me have been making it as well. So th this is an obvious point, really. He's predicting it's going to happen. I, I would imagine that, therefore, he thinks the Democrats are going to win the election in November and that the um, AOC-led you know, new wing of the Democrats, which basically support this point of view, will will become ascendant. 
and that it will all play out. I, I, I find it staggering if that happens, just for, for the following reason. Uh, by the way, I should remind everyone, I was against the DOJ regulating Microsoft and breaking it up as well. So this is not a new position for me. I'm, I'm a libertarian in terms of hands-off companies. Um, I especially find it offensive when a company becomes successful, everybody wants to break it up because why would you ever start a company if that was the case? And Keith's defense of Microsoft uh, is, is particularly painful, I'm sure, from his point of view, because they were the ones who cost him his, what, hundreds of millions, Keith, or billions of dollars with real names? Uh, they did cost me that, but that, you know, that there's principles and then there's personal experience. So, uh, uh, my personal experience was very negative. But by the way, that wasn't them using their brute force. That was Microsoft being cowardly in the face of the DOJ. Because real I'm opening a can of worms here. Let's let's move on. I shouldn't have uh, I shouldn't have mentioned real names. So yes. l l let's go back to Chamath's point uh, about uh, no. monopolies and governments. Here's why I think it's weird. As we globalize, the relevant authorities for a company end up being every government. No single government has absolute authority. Facebook has to deal with the EU, it has to deal with the UK, it has to deal with South Africa, it has to deal with France, as we've seen on occasion, even within the EU. So the regulatory authorities for a modern global company are in the hundreds. And uh, the US no longer has a monopoly of authority there. So if it tries to break Facebook up, the first thing I would do if I was Facebook is move my domicile somewhere else. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't put up with it. And I don't think it, it, it's a straightforward proposition as long as the target, in this case Facebook, is prepared to fight the case. It's an interesting, uh, it's, it's certainly an it's increasingly going to become, I think, the central issue in tech. I remember having an argument with Mike Arrington. It must have been at Low Web when, I don't know if you were on the panel, Keith, but uh, Mike was on it, uh, uh, Jack Dorsey. This must have been in about 2010. And I warned them that government regulation was coming. And Mike Arrington looked at me as if I was insane. Maybe I was back then, but certainly now this is the central issue. Let's move on because this is not a show about politics. It's a show about innovation and tech. You picked out a, a very quirky piece from Sam Altman, which I liked, uh, about the synergies or similarities between researchers and founders. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what is Sam seeing there? Well, he's reflecting on his recent experience. Sam is doing a lot of work through, I think it's a foundation, where he's working a lot more with researchers, having previously maybe worked with startup founders. Is this the AI thing he's working on, or is this something else? Do you know? The AI thing. So uh, I, th I think he's doing some other things as well, by the way. So there may be more than one source of this point of view, but for whatever reason, he's, he's been working with researchers recently. And, um, it, 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 you know, he knows that founders typically, um, you know, uh, are, are so uh, deep in what they're doing that they don't stand up and ask themselves a really important question that researchers do ask themselves, which is, am I working on the most important problems in this in this in the space that I work in? Um, you know, it's uh, I've I've been guilty of doing startups that really don't address the big issues, and that and what happens then is you. Really and you've also you've also been guilty of doing startups that only address the big issues and don't have any business coherence. So it, it goes both ways, right? Yeah, but the second actually is better than the first because investors will invest in big potential outcomes um, and they will never invest in coherent small outcomes. So working on the biggest problems is, is really good advice. And he's reflecting that maybe researchers and founders could have something in common there. And, and um, he leaves it as a question. He doesn't answer it, but I thought it was a, it was um, uncharacteristic for him because he's usually a very opinionated 
such a math-like person, but he was being quite reflective. Well, since this has become increasingly uh, biographical, Keith, in terms of your career, we can end also with another interesting piece of biography. Not everyone will know that Keith and I worked together in uh, about what, 18 years ago, something, Keith, uh, maybe 15 years ago. Actually, Keith will remind you, I worked for Keith. Uh, he always is reminding me of that. Uh, we worked at Santa Cruz Networks, which was a really early stage video platform startup. It, 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 and, and, it, and it had an investment from Draper, Tim Draper, and it was the sister or the brother company um, of, uh, of what, of Spo of, was it of Spotify? Uh, no, the, the audio company, Keith, uh, oh. uh, 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 Skype, sorry. So it was the brother sister company of Skype. We didn't go, uh, we, we, we didn't become millionaires and billionaires. They did, of course. But now video conferencing is back in, back in fashion. This is happening over Zoom. And for our final discussion uh, in this week's uh, episode, I'd like to talk about not only Zoom, but what comes after Zoom and the challenges and opportunities with video technology. Because what, um, what, uh, what um, Benedict. Uh, Be Benedict Evans, another uh, uh, very smart uh, observer of tech, asks and what, what he says in his What Comes After Zoom is that all these companies that conquer spaces aren't the first. Flickr wasn't the first uh, 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 photo sharing site. Dropbox wasn't the first file sharing site, but they do it better. And Zoom is far from being the first, or for that matter, the last uh, video platform. So Keith, does this make you all nostalgic for Santa Cruz networks and, and working in Santa Cruz? 15, 16 years ago? Yeah, it was 2003 and 2004, Andrew. And um, by the way, Barry Spencer, the founder, was a, a tech genius. Yeah. He basically had every feature that we have today with Zoom back then, um, including the ability to scale to hundreds of people on a call. And um, I did, in that, those days, meet Nicholas Sandstrom, the founder of Skype, to talk about merging the two companies because at that time Skype could only do a two-person call uh, which he he said no to which uh, if he, I hope Nicholas listens to this and realize what a big mistake that was uh, we had one well, he did all right Nicholas right we did fine we had one uh, competitor by the way in Sweden and Google acquired it and that became Google Hangouts so we were really really a very good platform what Benedict is saying is that this capability is becoming a commodity. That is to say, the ability to have one or more people on a video call, to share a screen, to listen to each other, is going to be for free in any app that wants it. So video apps are going to have to start specializing in very specific sets of features if they want to survive. So, mm. that, you know, you could imagine there might be a a TV show with an audience app where the audience can vote. Uh, the unbundling of Zoom to build experiences that are very specific. Let's, let's think of a job interview app um, with all the features that needed for job interviews or a home selling app with all the features needed to view and decide whether to buy a house. So he's predicting that the money in video is going to be in applying video to specific verticals. But and this goes back to the dilemma actually at Santa Cruz Networks, which I think actually you were very prescient on. When we joined, it was essentially a porn site in which people were undressing uh, in front of each other online. And, and that was their business model. What you figured is that this could be turned into a, a business to business opportunity in which we sold uh, video platforms in boxes to other, uh, other suppliers and other, other entrepreneurs. Are you saying, or is Benedict saying that Zoom will eventually become a B2B product or that they're going to be outmaneuvered by new platforms that 
uh, don't have to worry about supporting a consumer brand. He's not explicit, but I think the likely future is that Zoom will be a very successful company supplying generic voice and video services uh, faced with competitors who deliver roughly the same experience for free. Google's a great example of that. Or Apple. And, and therefore, Zoom is going to have to dedicate itself in the same way that Oracle does in databases to building tools for specific use cases if he wants to survive. B2B, yes, uh, but B2B these days can also be Slack-like in that it starts with individuals and then goes into an enterprise. So it doesn't have to be boring enterprisey. It just has to recognize the need for adding value to specific roles um, in, in the way that a generic platform doesn't have to. And what really resonated with me, I think mean, it's a really good piece and an interesting piece with a wonderful title, What Comes After Zoom, um, is how profoundly redundant Zoom has made Skype. I mean, Skype is without question the worst product in the tech industry. I have no understanding of why anyone would ever use it. Uh, mm -hmm. does, does Skype, Keith, have a future? And doesn't this suggest, hopefully uh, Microsoft won't buy Zoom as well, but in the end, Zoom will probably get acquired by one of the bigger platforms? Well, to firstly, Skype. I think even Microsoft, which owns Skype, probably is going to close it down very soon because Microsoft Teams, as Eclipse Skype, Microsoft Teams is much closer to the Zoom experience or the Slack plus Zoom experience. Um, and so I think Microsoft's already staked its future on Microsoft Teams. So I think Skype's going away. Um, I do, uh, what was the second part of the question? I forgot. Won't Zoom eventually end up in one of the bigger platforms? It will be acquired. I mean, Microsoft probably having already once bitten twice shy, having already wasted billions of dollars on Skype, it's not going to waste any more money, but maybe Amazon or or Google or even Facebook. Again, there may be issues on antitrust there, but uh, it, those would be interesting acquisitions. You know, Zoom's um, value right now is $77 billion. Which isn't that much, really. I mean, it's a lot to you and I, or most of the people watching, but in That's terms of, you know, fa uh, PayPal now is worth what, 250, 300 billion? I mean, these companies have money to make acquisitions if they need to. Well, Google, so if you, if you make a list of who could buy it, it starts probably with the phone companies, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. Mm. So. Although at I mean, that, talk about a fuck up. I mean, anything that AT&T buys by definition fails, right? Normally, Verizon, uh, we, we won't mention what happens to this. <laughs> Um, then you've got the big platforms. Well, Facebook doesn't really need it. Neither does Google. They've already got yeah. their own. And Facebook have their own problems anyway. Uh, LinkedIn could do with it, uh, but LinkedIn's well, LinkedIn's owned by Microsoft, so Microsoft that's... has Teams, so they're not going to buy it. So you're left with scratching your head. Who would buy it? Cisco to replace Webex. Webex is in need of replacement. That wouldn't. Well, be... that's another disaster. Maybe maybe it needs a Chinese buyer. That would. Uh... That would be an interesting acquisition, wouldn't it? So um, lots of good questions that we don't have answers to. Anyway, Keith, have a great weekend. We'll be back again next week. That was the week that was, and next week will also be the week that was. Have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, I hope you all read these articles. They're all very, all very provocative and interesting, even, uh, even um, Paul Graham's tweet of the week. Thank you.